Good evening, everybody. So I got a little bit of feedback from the last presentation. So this one isn't going to be as technical. Uh, there's going to be still some bits and pieces. You know, P P PCs built prior to 1997 did not have any USB uh, ports at all. And one of the problems with um, that PCs at that time is that, you know, we had a multitude of different types of ports uh, for different things. Um, we needed um, RS-232 ports for modems. We needed Centronix ports for printers. We needed SCSI ports for scanners and external hard drives. We needed PS2 ports for keyboards and mice. Um, and another problem was, is that a lot of other devices on the market needed these pass-through uh, parallel ports. Um, and so you ended up with all these dongles hanging off the back of the machine. Uh, in the picture here, I show a, a real PMP300, which was uh, one of the very first MP3 players ever made. And as you can see here, that there's this massive, you know, uh, parallel port pass-through dongle uh, that you would use to upload um, your your mp3s to it and of course you know it being only 32 megs and with the limitations of the parallel port you know uploading those 32 megs of mp3s would would take quite a while um when usb 1.0 came out it really wasn't used uh the usb ports were on the system boards uh but they weren't really being used for anything as well as the operating systems at the time didn't really support it uh, unless you count, you know, Windows 95, um, you know, um, or Windows 98. When the first edition of Windows 95 didn't even have any support for it, Windows 98 came with it out of the box. Um, describing the USB protocol in itself is kind of a presentation all on its own and highly technical. Um, it's a packet-based protocol rather than the per character protocol that we saw with RS-232. And it's very dry reading and it's not very interesting. Um, but basically uh, when all is said and done, uh, you know, there are lots of YouTube videos out there that describe the negotiation between the peripheral and the host of certain devices. Um, now, when ATX, the ATX specification came out in 1995, USB was part of that specification. In other words, uh, even though um, ATX had come out, um, you know, a little bit earlier, when USB came out, they lumped that into the specification to say, well, this is a legacy free PC. In other words, uh, no more serial ports, no more parallel ports, yada, yada, yada. Um, the other thing I'll probably, I'll touch on as well is something called USB PD, which means uh, USB power delivery, uh, because now we're seeing a lot more in the way of high speed charging devices on the, on the market. Uh, so, you know, we're charging our smartphones with it. We're charging our laptops with it. We're charging battery packs with it. Now, um, when we're looking at USB devices, um, the, there's actually three different types. There's type A, B, and C. Now, type A uh, USB is used for delivering power. So they always deliver power or source power, and they're always usually on, on host devices only. So this could be things like, um, you know, chargers, computers, and so on and so forth. Um, now, with type B, they receive power. So these are peripheral devices rather than host devices. So they're MP3 players, cameras, and so on and so forth. Um, now, when all of these different types of plugs were developed, uh, they developed a uh, standard sized, uh, mini sized and micro sized for both USB A and USB B. And for the most part, uh, mini and micro for USB A are obsolete. Um, but we do still see 
um, mini for USB type B and micro uh, considerably more for type B. Um, just as a note, uh, you should never see a, like a type A to type A cable or make a type A to type A cable because that will cause a short. You don't want to do that. Um, that is against uh, USB specification. Um, and because, you know, type A and type B did have some limitations built in, um, the type C uh, specification came out that is universal. So it's one single connector for everything, regardless of whether or not it is a host or a peripheral device. Um, now on the right here, you can see um, the different types of connectors. Um, you'll notice something right away that the USB connectors are, uh, the ones for the USB 3.0 are all blue. Um, now the ones in the lower right hand corner, the USB micro type B plugs, these were popular on some older uh, smartphones, but uh, they eventually just went back to the type B micro plugs. Um, now, when we talk about the pinout of USB, it's actually very simple. Um, we have uh, five volts power. We have ground and that's power ground, not signal ground. And then we have two data lines, uh, plus and minus, right? Uh, they call the power V bus. And on USB 1.1 and USB 2.0, uh, this is a power ground, not a signal ground. On USB 3.0, they added an additional ground for signal as well. Um, you'll also notice too that there is additional uh, pairs that are differential signaling pairs. And what I mean by differential signaling is that on one data line, the data is minus and the data plus, these are always different voltages. And the voltage reference to each other defines whether or not it is a zero or a one or what they call a J or a K state. So with USB 1.1, the differential one would have 2.8 to 3.6 volts on the data plus pin and zero to 0 0.3 volts on the negative pin. And then for the K state or differential zero, they would just reverse the, the states. Um, now, as part of one of the points here, I just thought I might want to mention the differential pairs use something called non-return to zero inverted encoding with bit stuffing. Now, I won't really get into exactly what all that is uh, because I'm sure none of us care. Ultimately, what it means is that um, the the voltages will will keep flipping. So if you even if you have like a, a long string of zeros or a long string of ones, the bits keep flipping all the time from the point of view of looking at the voltages. Uh, the idea is, is that you keep a relatively um, decent range of frequencies on the cable so that you don't end up with DC. Um, now with USB 2.0 and onwards, they reverse these differential voltages. Sorry, did I say reverse them? They, they decreased. They decreased these differential voltages um, to uh, millivolts. So, uh, you know, a differential one would be 360 to 440. And then the um, low part would be minus 10 to 10 millivolts. So they significantly reduce the amount of voltage swing. Um, now, there's two logic states on USB uh, to keep in mind. The first one they call single-ended zero. Single-ended zero is when both the D plus and D minus both go low. That's a valid logic state, and that is when the transceiver wants to reset the bus. Um, now, single-ended high or single-ended one is when D plus and D minus are both in, um, they're both 
like a positive voltage and this is an illegal logic state if you ever see that where d plus and d minus are both high and what i mean by both high is they both have a um you know the high voltage right either 3.6 roughly 3.6 volts or you know the 400 millivolts ish and you see that on both pins it could mean that the chip is blown right so um you should be seeing uh square waves um or you can see both pins low at the same time what i mean by low is uh low voltage um now with usb 3.0 they did it uh, introduce an additional differential pairs they introduced a receive differential pair and a transmit differential pair as well as there's the original differential pair which is part of the older specification um, now for a lot of usb cables uh, they tie the power ground pin to the shield right um, that's not against spec at least from my understanding it's not against spec um, now with USB micro and mini connectors, they added an extra pin and that's called a sense pin and that's meant for USB on the go. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, now, as you can see from the looks of the connectors, they were designed to be interchangeable. In other words, you can connect up uh, USB 2.0 devices to USB 3 devices, no problem uh, because they will fit. Uh, the other thing I just might want to touch on as well is that some older laptops have an eSATA port, which can also do double duty as a USB port. Uh, an eSATA port is meant for use with an external hard drive. I'm not going to really get into the specifics of that, but it's just something to look for if you ever see a laptop that says eSATA plus USB, and that can come in quite handy. Um, but yeah, it's, it is compatible with a different type of uh, SATA cable. USB 3.0 is significantly more complicated as we can see here. There's a lot more pins to um, discuss here. Uh, you'll notice that the plug pinout is slightly different from the receptacle pinout, but the idea is, is that you can flip the cable any way you like and it'll know what the orientation of the cable is and whether or not it is, it is connected. Um, so just like usb type a and type b there's only um there is the original d plus d minus pins um that are for usb 2.0 however uh these can actually be used to relay other data when usb is used in alternative mode now usb c offers a significant advantage that with alternative mode we can push other protocols over USB 3, like uh, DisplayPort, HDMI, AMHL, Ethernet, and even Thunderbolt. And by using those data pins, it negotiates back and forth with the downstream and upstream um, uh, uh, provider. Um, I say downstream facing port, upstream face, facing port, right? So. In USB 3.0, uh, your host supplying the power defines itself as the downstream facing port, and your um, peripheral is defined as the upstream facing port, which consumes the power. And who determines who does what is negotiated over the cable so even if you plug a computer into another computer which you could do with usb 3.0 uh, they both have to figure out what they want to be and then you won't end up with something wacky like a short happening and all kinds of nasty things won't start happening unlike if you had a usb type a to a usb type a cable where yeah you'd probably get a bit of a light show um now, the really interesting part to this is that there's also uh, the VBUS pins. And the VBUS pins sort of uh, do what the 5 volt power pin does, but they're programmable. So they can supply anything from 3.3 volts DC up to 24 volts DC, depending on what the DFP and UFP negotiate, right? Um, then there's the CC channels, 
and these are the channel configuration pins. And I've sort of noted how the CC pins work. Uh, the CC pins are used to figure out in which way was the cable inserted, if it was flipped or not, um, and whether or not there's a valid connection. There also is a few other detection capabilities and role detection, uh, but through the channel configuration is also who determines whether or not they're the DFP or the uh, UFP. Um, in the diagram I've cited here, uh, RP and RD, um, you know, the define, you know, the, the voltages for, you know, what goes across those, those uh, CC lines. Now, the other thing I thought I might want to mention is because we can flip this cable upside down, there's another pin called VCON, and VCON uh, if you notice where B5 is here on the plug pin out, uh, in a normal cable that is a passive cable, the link between CC2 and CC2 is severed. There's only one CC connection right over a cable, not two of them. But uh, when it is an active cable, uh, per the uh, diagram I've shown below here, you can have an active cable IC, which uh, communicates data across VCON to CC2. And all that really basically means is that um, with an active cable, you can push higher voltages across it and um, you know provide more for more charging current um, as well. Uh, so that's an active cable. An active cable will also say what kind of cable it is. Is it just a data cable? Is it a charging cable? What is it, right? So uh, typically in an active cable, little IC is tucked into the connector itself, uh, if you're kind of curious. Um, now, USB charging. Um, if you short... D plus and D minus together on a type A connector. Um, it reconfigures the port as what's called a DCP or a dedicated charging port. It will supply up to one and a half amps at five volts without any sort of host negotiation or anything like that. Um, and so typically what you might have, and maybe you might have seen them, if you ever wonder what a USB condom is, a USB condom is a special adapter that goes between a type A USB port and your machine. And all it does is it shorts those D minus and D plus pins together and forces it to become a DCP and prevents any you know data transfer. So your laptop, if you were on a plane or something, if you plug it into the USB, all it's going to do is just charge it and nothing else. Um, now, without the D minus and D plus pins shorted together, uh, you'll get 100 milliamps of current. Uh, and when the host negotiates with the, uh, like when the peripheral negotiates with the host, right, uh, you can get up to 500 milliamps of current when they identify themselves as a device. With USB 3.0, they up that to uh, 900 milliamperes. Um, a lot of proprietary adapters, like a lot of pro proprietary charging adapters, they'll have a, what they call a voltage divider between five volts and ground to provide for different voltages across the D minus and D plus pins to identify what the device is and thereby change the amount of charging current uh, available. So things like Apple chargers will provide a different voltage divider than a Samsung charger and so on and so forth. Um, if we want to get anything more than that, we need a smart charger, which has got a chip inside of it that negotiates with the device uh, that it's connected to. And they'll 
bump up the voltages and the currents depending on what they agree on. Again, it's completely automatic and it's a whole entire discussion all in itself as far as, you know, how that happens and how that bus negotiation happens. Uh, some chargers are stupid. Some chargers are smart. If it has a USB port on it, it could be something as simple as where they shorted the D plus and D minus pins together, and that's all it is. Some uh, some chargers actually have some brains in them, like the Anker, the A N K E R uh, smart charger I have has got a little computer in it that just, just figures out what it's supposed to deliver to the device, and the two just go back and forth and back and forth. Texas Instruments uh, developed a chip, the TPS 2514, that is designed to provide all of these different voltage levels for, you know, what is required. Um, I won't really get into that. This just, um, you know, uh, there is a reference. Um, now, again, the other thing we have to be careful about, too, is that USB cables need to be rated for the current and voltage that they're supposed to deliver. So cheap knockoff, poorly made USB cables, you could end up with some interesting scenarios um, where you would have the, the cable itself heats up or the connector heats up. Um, the specification for USB um, doesn't allow anything more than three amps at five volts um, on the connectors. So you have to be careful about that. If you have something that can deliver that, the cable needs to be able to handle it. Um, so USB power delivery is a bi-directional protocol between the source and the sink. That's the host and the device. In the specification, they refer to the host and the device as a source and the sink numerous times. Um, all of the USB PD host and device communication happens over that CC line. Uh, in type A, uh, over a USB C connector, over a type A connector, it happens over the data pins. Um, again, type A connectors are not rated for more than three amps at five volts. Um, USB type C can handle much higher voltages. Um, we talk about then USB PD SPR as opposed to EPR, a standard power rate as opposed to extended power rate. Um, and what they do is when they negotiate, they can go 5, 9, 15, or 20 volts at either 3 or 5 amps. And then EPR, uh, they bump that voltage up even further to 28, 36, or 48 volts DC at 5 amps. Now, the 48 volts at 5 amps is still relatively new. And you need to have special cables that are rated for this. Because one of the problems when a cable is rated for that is if you pull the connector out, you can get arcing. So the cable has to be explicitly rated for that voltage at 5 amps. And when I talk about anything over, you know, 5 volts here, um, that's the majority of USB-C that has to be rated for that. Uh, type A, I believe you can get up to 20 volts um, through proprietary chargers. Um, and of course, um, they all just negotiate automatically right now when you have a passive power cable um passive power cables can't go past 20 volts at three amps um anything else requires an active ic an active ic will do things like you know monitor for voltage sag and stuff like that um again it's all completely automatic right you just plug it in and either works or it doesn't work or you get the magic smoke one of the three um and then of course i talk about you know um, active delivery, power delivery cables, which support rates of 60 watts and higher. One thing we'll see a lot of more and more in the future is laptops where you plug in one single USB-C device and you will see uh, power delivery up to 200 watts of power right to a laptop with one single USB-C connection, right? Um, now, 
One thing I thought I might want to mention as well, there currently is no standard right now for how the cable is supposed to be labeled. Um, however, when you buy the cable, you'll see it right on the packaging. You'll see the logo right on the packaging of the cable to say what it's rated for. So um, just because the charger is capable of 48 volts at 5 amps doesn't always necessarily mean the cable is. And if the cable has an active IC in it that says, oh, well, I can't go past 28 volts, then it never will, right? Um, now, I did significant research on the USB PD present, like uh, the power presentation on um, on the USB consortiums board, and it's extremely dry reading, and it's extremely specific. And again, it's a presentation all on its own, and nobody would really be interested, anyways. But the point I'm trying to make is that when I read through it, I I nearly fell asleep because it's uh, quite complex. And I'm not really going to get into that. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that it is completely automatic. You just plug in and it just works. Uh, everything negotiates with everything else. Um, you know, I spoke earlier about USB on the go. And what is USB on the go? Well, someone figured out that maybe I want to use my smartphone as a USB type A device. So that's all this does is that when the sense pin is grounded to the ground connection, just through a jumper, uh, it turns a USB-B device into a USB-A device. So what it does is it, uh, in essence, allows for things like smartphones to be connected up to other peripherals. Um, so what you're typically going to find with a lot of smartphones these days is a little adapter that looks like the one in my picture, where it has a type B connector on one side, a type A connector on the other, and then you plug in your your device into that type A connector and off you go. Uh, you can actually take a floppy drive, a USB floppy drive and hook it up to your Android phone and it will work. And you will be able to store and you'll be able to save and, and um, read files from floppy disks using your Android phone, believe it or not. I've tried it, it, it actually works. Um, but I mean, outside of that, uh, where you would use it is, um, things like, uh, oh, it's a very good question. Um, something like, uh, where have I used it before? I've used it with like USB keys is a good example, right? Um, now, one thing I thought I just might wanna mention as well is that external battery packs could use USB on the go, but they don't. They typically always have one port for power in and one port for power out to comply with the standards so that there isn't any confusion as to whether or not a battery supplies or um, is being charged, supplies power is being charged by power. Um, I've never seen a, a USB battery pack that had like one single connector on it. They always usually have two. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about USB is that um, there's all these different colored connectors and you're probably always been wondering what they're for. Uh, when USB 1.0 and 1.1 first came out, they used white ones. And then when USB 2.0 came out, they used black. Then when USB 3.0 came out, they used blue. Then with USB 3.1 and 3.2, they switched over to teal. And then, of course, just to make things even more interesting, um, Huawei superchargers use purple ones, Qualcomm quick charger ones use green ones, and then yellow, orange, and red USB uh, connectors are either high current charging ports or they're what's called sleep and charge. Uh, sleep and charge is designed so that when the computer is turned off, you can still plug in a device and charge off the device. So a good example of that is let's say you have um, a mobile phone, like you have a smartphone and the battery's almost dead, right? And your laptop has one of these sleep and charge ports. You can connect it up and it, your laptop will actually charge your, your mobile phone right? Um, in a pinch, you can use it as an external battery, basically, um, provided that your laptop is configured for it. Um, 
Now, the reason why there's three different colors is because orange can be configured for something else. Uh, and that's usually either configured through an application on the laptop or it's configured through bias uh, as to whether or not to provide power on those ports. Um, USB B jacks follow the same convention as well, uh, with the exception of the uh, micro ones. Uh, I've seen blue ones, but I've never seen white ones. And I always, and sometimes I see black ones, but I've never seen micro ports of any other colors. Um, USB type C, they don't have any color, uh, probably because they're too small. Um, so when we, and the one thing about the speed designations, it's kind of confusing. So I'll, I'll kind of go over that a bit. Low speed, when it came out with USB 1.0, was designed explicitly just for keyboards and mice and not much of anything else, right? 1.5 megabit per second, um, or about 187 kilobytes per second. Um, full speed is the very first standard it, that officially came out. 12 megabit, 1.5 megabytes per second. And then when USB 2.0 came out in 2000, it in essence made SCSI devices obsolete uh, from the point of view of an end user that wanted to hook up a hard drive or something to their machine. Well, being that it was 60 megabytes per second or 480 megabit per second, we could now finally hook up things like scanners and hard drives and audio equipment and that kind of thing. Uh, before then, USB was just too slow. And then of course, then we have super speed. One thing you're gonna see a lot in BIOS, if you ever go into the BIOS on a computer, uh, is you'll have the option of setting ports to full speed or high speed and you're kind of like well what's the difference because you know they both sound very similar and high speed is the very first standard that was significantly faster so that's that's kind of the better way to understand it um then when USB 3.0 came out, they came out with super speed. And because they had so many different versions of super speed, you know, you know, five gigabit per second, 10, 20, 40 gigabit per second. Um, after USB 3.0, they started labeling the speed of what it was. So for example, when USB 3.2 came out in 2017, uh, they just bothered calling it super speed USB 20 instead of super speed plus plus, right? Um, basically anything that's USB uh, super speed is awesome. You can connect up anything and you're, it'll just work uh, from the point of view of um, speed, right? So you, you won't be waiting forever for hard drive files to load or something like that. Um, one thing I'm, I've been seeing more and more as well as NASes, like network attached storage, have these super speed connectors on them so that you can do things like directly connect the, the NAS up right to your machine and use it like a gigantic uh, hard drive bay. Um, one thing that we are seeing more and more of though is um, Thunderbolt 3, which was incorporated into the USB 4 standard. Thunderbolt 3 is a high speed standard that's used for laptop docking stations um, where you can drive multiple monitors with it, multiple NAS bays and so on and so forth. Enough about this though. So USB does have some limitations as far as the maximum number of devices and the maximum number of cascaded devices. So to understand this, USB has something called a root hub. And the root hub is always usually on the host, which is directly on the back of your computer or on the side of a laptop, but they call that a root hub. Everything is a star topology in USB. We can't have anything more than five daisy chain USB hubs and devices can't be any more than seven tiers deep. So we have in this particular situation where you see the, the square boxes labeled FUNC function, 
So we have the five USB hubs. And then the last device is the seventh tier, right? Um, now, while there isn't any limit on the number of physical ports that can be in a single hub, right? I've rarely ever seen more than 16 devices on a hub, right? So the other thing we have to keep in mind too is that we can have a maximum of 127 devices uh, across all ports everywhere. Um, although root hubs do not count as a device. Um, so that's also something to consider as well. Now, some desktop computers do have multiple root hubs. And if you were to add something like a, um, a USB 3.0 adapter card onto the machine, it would have its own root hubs as well. So we could say a maximum of 127 devices per root hub. So in theory, um, you know, we could have tons of devices, more than anyone ever would ever need. Um, now, the per port maximum current we can draw is 500 milliamperes with two po USB 2.0 and 900 milliamperes with USB 3, both at 5 volts. That, those are the maximums. Uh, the way we can get around this is by using a active USB hub instead of a passive USB hub. An active USB hub will supply the power to your devices and take the strain off of the root hub. If we exceed this, well, then uh, I'll get into that later. Now, there are some maximum cable lengths, right? Obviously, the faster the speed we go, the shorter the cable can, can be, right? Five meters with USB 1.0, or sorry, 1.1 and, and 2.0, and three meters with USB 3. And then, of course, by using repeaters, we can extend them out even further. Um, the 30 meters and 18 meters are theoreticals, right? Um, so there are special active USB cables you can buy with repeaters in them that allow for really long runs of uh, USB. A good example of that would be if you were setting up an auto audio visual setup and you needed a remote control or something in another side of the room and all the AV equipment was down the hall in a rack somewhere and you wanted to be able to have that USB port in that meeting room, right? So when I talk about the maximum current draw again, um, the 100 milliampere's uh, maximum draw is for stupid devices. I've kind of uh, illustrated here a few examples of devices which are stupid devices where you plug them in and they just supply five volts at 100 milliampere's. And yes, there really is a USB pet rock and no, it doesn't do anything, but it does create conversation. Um, so I've seen, you know, can chillers, coffee warmer mugs, uh, desk fans, all kinds of little baubles and marketing doodads that, you know, you can plug into a USB port and they do dumb things. Um, I already spoke about the maximum power limits for uh, drawing off of uh, unpowered USB hubs. Um, and the um, maximum current limit per USB device, as opposed to off of an active hub, which is considered one device, and then the power supply does all the hard work. Um, now, the fortunate thing about the USB standard is that if you exceed the maximum power draw on a specific USB port, a lot of devices have a soft circuit breaker, which kills the power to all the devices that are connected to the root hub. In other words, what would happen is, is that all your devices just go dead. And then the only way to fix it is to power cycle the hub or the entire machine, depending on where that root hub is, is encountered. Another good example of that is if a active hub is designed correctly and you overload one of the ports on it, um, it will just shut all the power off to the devices. And then you just power cycle the active hub instead of everything else. Um, and again, I talk about you know, battery charging mode as well, which gives you three times the amount of current that you would normally get. Um, 
Now, the other thing that USB has this really big problem with, and this is something that we need to keep in mind, is that type A and type B, when they were developed, they never really thought people would be repeatedly removing and inserting USB devices like they do today. And so the type A connectors are only rated for 1500 cycles of insertion and removal. It doesn't sound like a lot, but believe me, that's actually just rated spec. It's much lower. Uh, USB mini Bs uh, are rated for 5,000 because they figured it would be used for mobile devices. And the micro B connectors are rated for 10,000 cycles of insertion and removal. Um, now, USB Type-C, when they developed it, they developed it so that the wear and tear happens to the plug and not to the plug. Because, or, sorry, the wear and tear happens to the plug itself, not to the jack. Excuse me, I'm tripping over my words here. Um, they figured out that, you know, replacing the plug was significantly easier to do than replacing the jack. And newer USB micro B connectors are also designed so that the the, the jack wears out first and not the plug, right? Um, when we start getting up to approximately around 60% of the rated uh, insertion removal cycle uh, rating of these connectors, we're going to start noticing a few things. The connectors will start getting loose and wobbly, right? In some cases, they may even easily come out. It won't take a lot of force to remove it. Um, the other problem is that sometimes we can start end up um, getting things like um, the device will pop in and out of the device manager. So um, it's as if we were inserting it and removing it, even though we're not really. And then you wiggle it and then it's fine, right? Uh, sometimes Windows will complain about a malfunctioning USB device. Um, it's been my own personal experience that 60% of 1500 and 60% of 5000 is when these things start to wear out. Uh, even the older type uh, C connectors, um, I used to plug in my phone every night to charge the battery and then unplug it to take my phone out. And within about three years, so that's uh, roughly 900, 900 times almost close to a thousand, I started having problems with it getting loose and wiggly. Uh, so uh, that's just something to expect, right? Um, of course, the one thing I do want to say as well is that you should always make sure that USB ports are free of dirt and debris. Uh, it can kill USB ports and it can kill devices. Uh, there was a scenario where um, I had a little micro B connector that was connected up to a charger on my car and my wife got in and she had some mud on her boot and the connector you know brushed against the mud on her boot she didn't really think of it she plugged it right into her phone and then we were about 10 minutes into our drive and I said do you smell something burning and she said well yeah I guess I do what smells like burning and the uh, the USB port on her phone was completely scorched it was completely ruined and uh, she had to get a new phone because we couldn't repair it. So just uh, something to keep in mind. Now, in a pinch, if you do find that you have a, uh, a loose USB port, sometimes you can shim it with a little piece of paper and it will tighten it up enough where you can continue to use it. Uh, but it's just as a workaround, you shouldn't be doing that normally. It's just enough just so you can get things working. Um, I've had to do that very rarely, but it sometimes helps in a pinch, uh, no pun intended. Um, so a few things about USB in the shack. Um, always use high quality na name brand cables whenever and whenever you can. Uh, StarTech ones are fairly cheap, but they are uh, still high quality, right? Um, and where I'm going with this is that if you go on to, you know, Alibaba or you go on to eBay and you buy some unknown brand you've never even heard of before and, you know, um, it's like a $2 USB cable, well, it could give you a lot of problems, right? Uh, it's not worth the time or the effort. Um, braided ones are nice, I got to admit. 
Uh, there's some extra cost to them, but they just look nice. They don't really serve any useful function outside of looking nice and being resistant to tangling. Uh, mono price is a good one. Uh, Circa Max is another good one. Um, you know, th there's plenty of, of USB cable manufacturers that sell a decent cable out there. There was a scenario that happened a while back where there was a guy at Google who was testing USB cables and there was a knockoff manufacturer that was selling USB C cables that blew up his Chromebook. Um, so you got to watch out for that because some USB C cables are not built within specification and they can actually damage devices. So you, fortunately, those cables are mostly gone off the market, but just something to keep in mind. Um, and a lot of devices, especially things like RSP dual radios or SDR play radios, they always say that you load the software for the device before you plug it into the computer right? Uh, that's true of a lot of devices. That'll save you some grief. Uh, unless the manual explicitly says that you can just plug it in and your machine will just automatically load the drivers. Um, so if you have problems with USB devices that are disappearing and reappearing when you're transmitting, you may want to try using shorter cables, avoid coiling them up and use um, chokes like, you know, uh, uh, ferrite, ferrite chokes on your USB cables, right? In the, in the picture I've shown above, uh, the cable that came with my ICOM OPC uh, data cable has a ferrite choke built right into the cable. Uh, so I would recommend that if you have any USB cables that plug into a transceiver or any equipment that emits RF, uh, put some ferrite chokes on them. Um, and you should be doing that one at the radio and one at the computer, uh, ideally, right? Um, don't chain hubs together, especially uh, USB 2.0 and USB 3.0 hubs, uh, unless you have no other choice. Um, if you can have multiple USB hubs off the root hub of the computer or the laptop, do so. But if you have a shortage of USB um, connectors on the back of your computer and you want to chain cables together, uh, you can. You can chain hubs together as long as they're all the same USB spec, right? Um, but again, you want to probably avoid that to try and reduce problems, right? Uh, but you can do it in a pinch. Here's the thing though, if you take a USB 3 hub and you chain it to a USB 2.0 hub, then you only get the USB 2.0 speeds. It degrades the speeds and you'll, you'll get a warning within Windows telling you that these devices could operate faster, right? Um, so you want to avoid mismatching USB hubs. Um, use powered hubs whenever possible. Uh, avoid using passive hubs unless you find something you know in a bottom of a drawer somewhere and you want to use it in a pinch using powered hubs can save you some grief later on especially if you have a lot of devices that draw a lot of power right and if you have switchable usb hubs these are even better because you can remove and add usb devices at will without having to unplug them and plug them back in and the cost to using one of like buying one of these hubs isn't that much more. Um, in the example I've shown above, not only do we have you like uh, lights to indicate whether or not a device is connected, but we also have a switch that we can enable or disable that device upon as trouble for troubleshooting measures, or maybe we don't want power going to that device for some reason. It just makes things uh, a lot easier and prevents wear and tear on the connectors as well. Um, and I also say this too, this has been my own experience as well, is if you have a transceiver with a USB connection on it, always connect it up to a powered hub, never directly to a root hub on the back of a machine because if you do have high RF levels in the shack and you end up blowing up the USB port, you end up blowing up the USB port on your powered hub and not the one on the back of your computer. 
a powered hub is significantly cheaper to replace than an entire mo motherboard. So um, I personally experienced this uh, and I wasn't happy when I blew up one of the USB ports in the back of my computer. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a lesson to be learned. One thing I didn't really say here is it also helps too in your shack grounding to run a ground lead from your shack ground to the case of the computer so that you don't end up in a situation where you could have a, a potential on, on the ground of a USB cable, um, because it will be tied to the ground of the machine. Um, now, a uh, few things to troubleshoot USB. Uh, we're on a second last slide here. Um, they are static sensitive and you can blow them up just through a static blast. Um, if you are getting up from your chair or something, you go to reach over and you go to plug in a USB cable and um, you have a bit of a static charge on you, you can end up destroying the USB port. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't hurt to ground yourself first before you plug an USB cable or avoid touching the metal part of the, of the plug, right? Uh, I talked about using ferrite chokes whenever and whenever possible uh, to prevent destroying the inputs of the uh, USB jack, right? Um, if you find that the USB is, is flaky, like a USB device is flaky and it's kind of bouncing up and down and like disappearing in and out of your device manager, you know, try another cable, right? Maybe the cable's bad. Uh, same thing like the USB jack, maybe the USB jack's bad or maybe it's flaky. So try another one, right? Um, if you're finding that a device is again, being flaky, and it's on a USB hub, bypass the hub, go directly to the to the uh, root hub and see if the problem persists, take the hub out of the equation. I have personally seen it where USB hubs have been faulty uh, or they get really flaky. So uh, eliminate the hub as the root of the problem. Um, also make sure too that if um, you have a situation where a bunch of devices connected up to a, an active hub all stop working, well, does it have power, right? A lot of active hubs will have LEDs on them to let you know that it's actually on and working. Um, I've seen it where I bumped a power, uh, like a power brick and it stopped providing power to an active hub and then nothing worked on it. And an active hub will not, work without power. That's the key thing here. Um, I've spoke about, you know, look for loose and worn or dirty connectors, look for kinked or damaged cables if stuff is acting funky, right? And of course, looking at your device manager, um, you can see devices disappear and reappear depending on what's going on. When you keep hearing the hardware disconnect and hardware reconnect sound constantly, that's the best thing to do is take a look in the device manager to see what's disappearing and what isn't. Um, another problem I had, uh, someone was complaining that they were connecting up their cell phone to their computer's USB port and it took eight hours for it to charge and it was still not charged. And it turned out what they were doing is they were plugging their, their phone's USB cable into the, one of the black ports on the front of their computer and it wasn't really supplying much in the way of amperage to the phone. So the phone was taking forever to charge. And um, he was working late one night and he said it took 14 hours to charge his phone. I thought, yeah, you're using the ports in the front of your computer, aren't you? He says, yeah, why don't you use your, your USB charger that came with your phone? He says, uh, I didn't have one at work. And I suggested where he could buy one that would also support the rapid charging as well. Another thing to look for as well is a lot of these uh, Anchor um, uh, USB chargers that you can buy, they'll have two green ports and then the rest of them will either be red ports or black ports. Um, they only have a limited number of quick charge ports on them. And that's because of the amount of current they draw and because of the chips they use. So you also wanna be sure too that your if your phone does support 
quick charging you're using the green ports and not the blue ports right um or the black ports depending on who made it um so that's pretty much it does anybody have any questions uh, thank you very much i had a whole bunch of questions on my sheet and i've got a check mark beside most of them here so you answered a lot of my questions i'm a bit frustrated but no actually i'm, I'm very happy that uh i've got some things to do here on my checklist uh that uh you, you gave me some good suggestions especially about putting a, a powered hub uh for my shack pc because i have probably too many things plugged directly into uh, into that PC. Um, and putting ferrites on both ends of the cable, I think is a, is a good suggestion as well. Uh, one of the uh, all time questions about USB, I, I, this is not just me, but is why does it always take three times, three attempts to plug in a USB cable uh, when there's only two possible ways to do that? I, I think, uh... The engineers that designed the, the USB, like there's a, um, a USB consortium of a bunch of different companies that all work together to develop the USB standard. And I'm sure at one of these meetings, they asked the same exact question and somebody said, okay, well, in our next standard, let's develop a cable that's, uh, um, you know, universal. We can plug in both ways without the Schrodinger's cat approach to, uh, you know, inserting USB. Cause I have, I have run in, into that myself too. I went to go plug in it. It's not going in, flip it, doesn't go in, flip it. It work, goes in always the third try. And I have personally experienced that. So um, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, some uh, to answer your question, Jerry, though, uh, there's two things to look for. Uh, USB cables will always have uh, the right side up with, and they'll have the USB logo usually on the top of the connector, uh, right side up, which doesn't exactly help if you have a PC where all the USB ports are vertical, in which case I believe if my memory serves me right, it's always so that the top of the cable is facing right. Um, and you'll see that USB logo on the top of the connector. The other thing to look for as well to know whether if you're inserting it correctly is look for the seam on a type A connector. Uh, the seam will always be on the bottom of the cable as opposed to the top. Uh, so that's another thing to look for as well. Um, to answer uh, Peter's question here, his question was, can USB hubs add to latency? I'm thinking CW or waterfall here. Absolutely, they can. Um, uh, because it's a star device, right, and we're aggregating uh, a large number of ports into one single USB connection. Um, if you have a lot of data going across all of the USB devices all at the same time, or worse yet, you've cascaded hubs. So you've cascaded one hub to another hub to another hub, uh, and you have all of them populated with uh, USB devices that are all transmitting and receiving data all at the same time, uh, you can definitely get um, latency introduced into the um, into the signal. Now for latency critical applications, like you're talking about with waterfall and the like, uh, you might notice something, right? Uh, where you would probably notice latency the most though would be something like a mouse, uh, where um, you would have a mouse that would be moving around. And if you notice that there was a lag between what you saw happen to the mouse pointer on the screen to what you did with the mouse, then you know it was introducing enough latency to be a problem. The other thing I've also personally seen is that if there's something wrong with the USB transceiver chip, see a, a USB hub will have these, these uh, integrated circuits with multiple USB ports going to them. And if there's something wrong with the, with the IC, the IC could be introducing a lot of errors into uh, the USB stream and thereby causing an issue where all of a sudden now things start getting a little chunky, a little jerky, uh, weird stuff like that happening. Again, it's an issue of just trying a different port and seeing if uh, 
of the problem goes away. Uh, assuming you're using a different IC uh, on the USB hub, right? Um, and uh, my own personal experience as well is uh, uh, I, um, you know, have swapped out hubs that have been quite defective. That introduced a lot of latency. Uh, I had an individual where they complained that their mouse was all laggy and I swapped it out and all of a sudden now everything was fine. So it was just swapping out the USB hub. So yeah, there's, there's a, a very real possibility. And the more you cascade things, the more latency gets introduced. Um, to answer Peter's other question about, uh, so is it better to connect the flex to the laptop directly? Um, this is a little different because uh, a flex will communicate via ethernet rather than via USB, right? Um, some people do do that. Like if they're operating uh, a, a flex on a field day or something, they'll just use a ethernet crossover cable directly right to the laptop and they communicate with it that way and that will work um, having a usb switch or not a usb switch excuse me having an ethernet switch between the the flex and the computer probably won't introduce that much latency we're talking maybe a few milliseconds at most especially if it's on a even if you have a couple of extra devices on that Ethernet switch. But yeah, all my USB devices, I connect them all directly right up to my computer. And then my computer goes to a Ethernet switch. And then from the Ethernet switch, I then connect up the flex and I don't notice any latency at all. Uh, but the one thing I did ensure is that my flex is on the same switch as my computer. So that way the switch, if the switch uh, can relay traffic directly from the flex to the computer, it's almost like I were using a a crossover cable. Um, so that's just something to think about, right? Um, uh, serial to USB adapter cables um, work at such slow data rates that latency really isn't a problem. Um, and issues with, uh, you know, poor throughput and the like um, are very rare. I mean, if we think about even the um, let me just go back through the standards here. I mean, USB um, 1.1 operated at 12 megabit per second, and a USB to serial adapter cable um, wouldn't really operate anything faster than 115,200 bit per second. Uh, even if you get like the megabod ones, it's still a fraction of what the USB 1.1 standard is capable of. So um, unless you have something wacky going on, like you have, you know, five hubs all cascaded and, and you have all of them populated with 16 devices a piece, uh, even then you probably wouldn't experience much in the way of... Uh, problems so it's a pretty resilient standard that works well over usb should you try to remember on a laptop which device plugs into which port not really it's not that important probably what is more important is if you have a hub um you may want to uh, wrap a piece of red tape around the the um around the base of the cable so that you know it's a hub um, so that you don't end up in a situation where you could accidentally plug a hub into another hub by accident and then wonder why nothing's working. Um, all USB hubs always have like a, uh, upstream, uh, USB connection that goes to a host, right? Um, but generally though, um, you know, unless you have a port that you know is bad or faulty, you know, um, if you have to have a port that's bad or faulty, just fill it with glue or something to stop you from plugging any more USB devices into it to save yourself some frustration. But yeah, USB shouldn't care about what port you're plugging into at all. Um, maybe the only exception to that is when we're talking about these um, sleep and charge ports um, or the dedicated charging ports. Uh, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, on my front of my computer, I have um, um, a drive bay that's got four USB ports on it. Three of them are blue and one is red. 
And I personally have experienced it where I didn't have my coffee in the morning. I went to go plug a device into the red port, wasn't thinking. And I was like, why isn't this working? All I'm, all it's doing is charging and I'm not seeing any data. All oh, right, that, yeah, that's the charging port. And then I just moved it and then I was fine. So um, yeah, just uh, keep that in mind. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. I've got a lot to uh, think over now and I've learned a lot tonight. Uh, excellent. Um, more than I ever dreamed about USBs, but uh, uh, that was really good. So, and it's such an important uh, topic now with uh, everything connected by computer and, uh, you know, not like the old days where you actually had a radio that just, uh, you know, you, you uh, had a power supply radio and an antenna and that sort of thing. But now everything's going through computers and computer logging and, and everything else, uh, digital modes, and it just, uh, it can get out of hand. So um, I've, I've got some work to do. Uh, okay, very good, thanks.